Live from ClickOrlando.com, this is News 6 at 5.30. This is a News 6 Plus takeover. Here now is Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells with Talk to Tom. Well, hi there, and welcome back to another edition of Talk to Tom. I am Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. Thank you for tuning in, whether you're watching on WKMG News 6 on a Thursday afternoon or on News 6 Plus. We really appreciate you tuning in. Talk to Tom is a great big dream come true for me. Started out in 2004, just taking your questions during hurricane season, built to a Facebook project, and now it's turned into this, a weekly video podcast for you at home to answer your questions. If you have a question you'd like to have answered, please send it in to us at clickorlando.com forward slash talk to Tom. Today, we're going to be talking about tornadoes. Um, Hard for people to understand how many tornadoes we actually get in Central Florida. We will be talking about the twisters and what you need to know to stay safe as they touch down. But first, we're going to answer your questions. Today's first question comes to us from Geneva Bledsoe. Geneva is from Kansas. She says, we have a lot of tornadoes in Kansas. We also have an extensive warning system. Every Monday at noon, the sirens are sounded. You know where you are and just how easy it is to hear them. What is up with a warning system in Florida? I've never heard a siren. Not to warn or test. A tornado went through Ocala last year, and I had no idea it was only about a mile away. Florida needs to step up their game. No, Toto. I'm not in Kansas anymore, but I would like to be warned where I am. Okay, Geneva, that's a great question. Um, I, I just tell you the bottom line is money because it's super expensive now. To do that, for us to put up warning sirens, sound dies out after about 9 or 10 miles. So for us to try to warn the large expansive area that is Central Florida would be very, very expensive. Also, technology has changed so much. I do know that Oviedo does have a siren system going. I know they do. If you go to like their government site for the city of Oviedo, they do have a siren that they sound during a tornado warning. Not many other communities in Florida do. And the whole world has changed, Geneva, to the, to the point where on your phone, hold up your cell phone, anytime on your phone that you're somewhere, if you have a smartphone and you're anywhere in a tornado-warned area, your phone blows up. <clears throat> it starts the warning because we are now geofenced. And so when the weather service puts out a tornado warning, boom, it goes right to your phone because your phone knows where you are. And when that warning is issued, it goes right to your phone. Also, you can do it through our app. Just go to WKMG Weather App, download the weather app, put it in your pocket, turn on the alerts when you think the weather's looking ominous, and it will warn you through geofencing when a watch or warning has been issued for your area as well. So just know, the reason we don't have them here in Florida is because they're very expensive. People are in their homes a lot. The sound does not penetrate the home nearly as well as the sound coming through your phone. So the phone is the new reliable way. The phone and the warning systems through the phone and the geofencing of your area have kind of made the sirens obsolete. It's also made your weather radios obsolete for a lot of folks too. Although there are some places in America where the cell system is trash. It's hard to pick up a signal and the weather radios are still super important for those areas. Great question, Geneva. Hope it works out for you. All right, next up. John Christie goes, hi, Tom. I miss your daily Facebook messages due to my new work hours. John, you can always come back and look at that stuff later. I've always been a weather fanatic, and when there is a local tornado threat, I oddly get excited. Okay. The other day, I was driving through a car wash. I was wondering the wind at the end of the cycle. How does that measure up to a tornado if you were by chance near one? The roof of my SUV pops when the wind blows pressure. It does, yeah. I was curious to know if this may be what it feels like to be close to a tornado nearby. I know Troy has tornado chasing experience. He does. And was wondering if the car wash blower gave the feel of a weak tornado. Obviously, any tornado threat, you shouldn't be outside or in a car. But I was curious. Love you guys. You're awesome. Okay, John, we love you too. Thank you for watching. Thank you for knowing that Talk to Tom is also a Facebook entity. And you can always go on there and go back and look at the old ones there. I don't take them down. So they're there if you want to watch them. If you miss one because you're working, come back, watch it in the afternoon. I don't mind. Uh, going to the car wash does have wind speeds, they say, of somewhere like 60 to 80 miles per hour to blow the raindrops off your car and super dry your car very quickly. But to have 
wind blowing out of hoses that are above you does not create a wall of wind a mile wide doing 100 miles per hour. And obviously your car can maintain wind speeds as long as it's going into the wind or creating the wind driving at 100 miles per hour. Your car is aerodynamic. But to be hit from the side or the front, if you're in a seated position and the wind's blowing 100 miles per hour, it can flip your car, lift your car. Wind speeds around a tornado are crazy because they're going toward the tornado one moment and then the tornado gets past you, they whip around the other direction the other moment. And so cars roll, they fly through the air, they get picked up, they get smashed into each other. It's a real mess. So a controlled area with just a big hose blowing out one jet of 80 mile per hour wind is not the same as being hit by a tornado, no. It's interesting to wonder what that's like. And we do have big fans in what we call wind tunnels that can replicate the kind of winds, the kind of turbulence that you get during a hurricane or a tornado. Down in South Florida, we have one at FIU. We've got that big wall of wind, they call it, that I've been to, Candace has been to. We've showed it before during a hurricane special. But the wall of wind does a better job of replicating that because the fans are so huge and they can make the winds come in varying directions rather than one small hose putting out a burst of wind. All right, next up, Tina. She says she gets headaches before the storm. You've been told it's due to the barometric pressure change. Is that true? What is barometric pressure? Why does it cause headaches? before storms. Okay, to, that probably is true. And the barometric pressure is the weight of the atmosphere weighing down on you. And what we mean when we say there's low pressure is that all of a sudden there's a lift in the atmosphere. The air around you, the pressure's dropping. The air is lifting. And so the pressure inside your sinuses starts to change as well. Some people handle that better than others. So if the pressure is dropping, air around you is lifting, Clouds are forming and a storm is coming. If a cold front's coming in, giving lift to the atmosphere, the pressure is dropping. The weight of the atmosphere is coming off you just a little. That does affect some people very badly in their sinus cavities. And I've heard from a lot of people, they know that something's about to change because they get a headache. I don't have that problem. I'm sorry that you do, but yeah, that's for real. It does cause headaches because the air is having a hard time changing in your sinus cavities. And finally, from our friend, Andrea. She has submitted several questions, but she wants to know, oh, is it true lightning can turn sand into glass? That is true. You've obviously been watching uh, the movie Sweet Home Alabama. That was a big hit movie. I, when was that movie out? I mean, that's an old movie now. The movie's got to be 20 years old. It's got to be. But it's forever on the, the repeat channels at night, so a lot of folks see it. In that movie, the lightning strikes the, the metal, and they go where the metal is and dig and pull out a big, long piece of something that looks like glass they polish it up and it's beautiful and it looks like the path of the lightning going through the sand that is absolutely true that is possible that does happen it normally happens on beaches that are whiter made of more quartz and silica rather than some of the beaches that are brownish or blackish like if you go over to venice beach florida over in southern sarasota county the sand in venice is really dark dark and has like streaks of black running through it that is old ancient made sand and that's why they have they call themselves the shark capital of the world they have the big shark's teeth you can find all the time those aren't new shark's teeth those are shark's teeth from you know centuries ago thousands and thousands if not millions of years ago they're coming up and they're like fossilized teeth and so is the sand the sand is made up of of old ancient earth and that's why it's black and brown you go over to like Siesta Key, where the sand is white, or up in Pensacola, where the beaches are super white, here in Florida, that sand is quartz and silica based, and that's been stuff that was washed down through the Appalachian Mountains, the erosion of the country, into the Gulf of Mexico, and then dispersed by the motion of the ocean or the currents. And so that sand is high in quartz and silica, and that sand does make good pieces of glass or fulgurite, I think is what it's called. When you get a lightning strike and it makes that little jagged piece. Sometimes they're about this long. They're hardly ever more than like 18 inches long. Sometimes they're clumpish, depending on how much quartz is in the sand. But if you don't have good quartzy, whitish colored sand, it doesn't happen. Um, I remember when the movie was out the first time, I talked about this on some show, and they told me then that the desert sands, like the Sahara, that are super white, Sometimes a lightning storm will finally come over, and when a lightning strikes there, they get really well-produced pieces of glass out of that. Not so much in a place with brownish 
sand or orange sand. Like the orange sand, like in Daytona Beach, if you see the orangey color, that's made from the coquino rocks, from the crushing of those. And so if you get gritty, brown, gray, orange sand, doesn't do as well. It has to be silica and quartz based. All right, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you for your questions. I really appreciate the questions today. They were all excellent. Remember, you can submit your questions anytime on clickorlando.com slash talk to Tom. Stay with us now as we take a closer look at the increase in tornadoes and what you need to do to keep your home and family safe. All right, everybody, welcome back to Talk to Tom. I'm Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. Thanks for sticking around for the second half of the show. Earlier in the show, I answered your questions. Remember, you can always submit a question anytime you want to join the party here at Talk to Tom. Just submit your question to clickorlando.com forward slash talk to Tom. We'd love to answer your questions, maybe get you on with video or maybe get you on live, but we will try to answer anything you have questions about and everything you need to know. Right now, we want to talk about protecting your family. We're going to focus on tornadoes, their damaging effects, and what you need to know. Joining me now as an expert, this is Aris Papadopoulos with the Resilience Action Fund to talk to us about tornadoes. Hey, Aris, welcome to Talk to Tom. Tom, thanks for having me on your show. Yes, it's going to be exciting. Let's talk about tornadoes and their threats and the danger. You say your home is a very important element in keeping you safe. Obviously, you don't want to be trapped outside during a tornado. The house, the home, not your automobile, but your home is the place to be, correct? Absolutely. If you can't be safe in your home, then, uh, you know, you're, you're going to have to look uh, quite a bit to find a safe location. All right, let's talk about the, the most important thing I always think about is, Lord, what if my roof comes off my house? What do people who are watching Talk to Tom and watching you right now need to know about keeping your roof safe during a tornado? Yes, the roof is the most vulnerable part of a house. And unfortunately, many of the houses we've built over the last, uh, let's say, half century uh, can't even withstand an EF0 tornado. So if you're building a house today or if you're uh, improving a roof, replacing a roof, try at least to get a roof that's built to 135 miles an hour uh, wind level. That would be kind of taking care of the EF2 close to EF3 level. In South Florida, where I live, we're building roofs to take care of EF4 level uh, events, uh, tornadoes and, and hurricanes. So, you know, at, um, at minimum, uh, a 135 EF3 uh, level uh, roof. And I wouldn't just go by the code because codes move very slowly and a lot of uh, towns and even parts of, of northern Florida have uh, have lower standards. I'd ask for an above code roof. Uh, I'd look at a standard which is called Fortify that's been developed by the insurance industry and ask the contractor, whoever you're talking to, can you get me a fortified roof that will take care of wind and also water that could leak into the uh, into the house. Not to go off the rails here, but our standards in Florida have gotten better, have they not, in the last 20 years? They really have. It used to yes, be the they definitely have. Uh, but they differ depending where you are in the state. If you're in South Florida, the wind standard is excellent, and it's been mm -hmm. that way for over 20 years. But if you're in Central and Northern Florida, the wind standard is not that strong. I mean, the people in Mexico Beach, uh, you know, only right. built to a 130 mile an hour wind, and they saw a Category 4 uh, hurricane, uh, you know, a few years ago that took them up to 160 mile an hour. So, right. you know, depending where you are in Florida, you may not be, uh, you know, your code may not be that strong. You may not be as protected as you think. All right, let's talk about my next yeah. one. The one I love uh, also that I love the most is the garage door because I have to abandon my family during a hurricane. I, I don't do this every time there might be a tornado, but every time there's a hurricane, I end up driving one of my cars in and back in my wife's car right up against the garage door because a failing garage door can really spell havoc. Exactly. Yeah. After the roof, the garage door is the most vulnerable part of the house, because if that door blows out, then that whole house is subject to the wind. And if that wind gets in through the garage, then it can blow up, blow out the roof, the walls and start tearing down the whole house. So I look at the garage doors that are rated at least to 135 miles an hour. They have reinforcement on the door. They also have reinforcement along the sides that connect the door to, to the walls. So I'd ask for at least 135 mile an hour rated uh, garage door. So that 135 mile per hour wind, that's, that's a pretty good standard. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, that, that should take care, you know, especially for tornadoes. 
you know, people are, are, are concerned, well, what if it's a, an EF mm -hmm. three or four or five? But what we should know is that even, you know, those very intense tornadoes, most of the width of the tornado will be below 135 mile an hour. Probably 80 to 85% of the width will be less than 135 mile an hour. So if we can do the 135 kind of, you know, strength, we're taking care of a big part of what a tornado might bring to us. Just about everything. Okay, let's talk windows and door shutters. I do not have them on my house. I don't have shutters at all for my windows. How expensive is that, and is that really necessary? Well, if your uh, windows and doors are not hurricane rated, are not mm -hmm. wind rated, uh, definitely you need, if a, if a hurricane is approaching, you need to have some kind of protection. You know, you can go with a plywood, you know, as, as people are seen and doing. Right. Yes, you can get the metal shutters, the aluminum shutters, which are lighter, that are more expensive. But nowadays we have something even better that's a uh, fabric. It's actually the same fabric that's used on airbags for uh, automobiles. It's very strong. And uh, you can get that uh, either online or at big box stores. And it's a lot easier to install that on your windows uh, from hmm. the outside. And of course, it's uh, you know screwed on. And that'll protect the the window from the both the wind and the debris that might be flying in the wind. Okay, so, Aris, you know, I, I don't know what that is. What's it called? It's, you say it's a fabric, like it looks like a piece of tent or a parachute. Or what yes, does it look it, like? it's a piece of tent. Uh, oh. you, you order it to the size of your your windows and doors. Uh, I ordered a couple a few years ago uh, for my backyard uh, uh, window and door, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it's it's easy to store. It rolls up, uh, you know, and hmm. it's easy to. You know, uh, unroll and and uh, just screw onto the uh, the holes around the the window and door so uh, it, it's a uh, hurricane fabric that's what they're generally called you know so okay. you can google that up or ask you know in your big box store okay i'm gonna go looking for that that's a new step that i haven't seen and i certainly haven't done for my family that might be a thing i want to look into okay let's talk yeah. flood protection it's it's a pet peeve of everyone here now because so many people live in a flood area and don't know it or they have um, hurricane insurance, but don't realize the storm surge will be ruled a flood. There's all kinds of things to talk about in thunderstorms and home protection related to floods, correct? Exactly. Yeah, it's very unfortunate that we don't know what our flood risk is. And unfortunately, the FEMA maps, to me, are not very reliable. Uh, I go to a nonprofit called First Street Foundation. They created a couple of years ago an excellent uh, resource. It's called Flood Factor. Dot org. You just put in your address and it'll tell you your flood risk. And it, it has a dial, let's say, from, from 1 to, to, uh, to 10. Mm -hmm. If you're over a 5, between 5 and 10, you're at high risk. And uh, you, you need to be doing some, some something. Okay, last issue, preparing to lose power. It happens all the time in Central Florida, either through hurricanes or through tornadic activity or through just thunderstorms and lightning strikes. A lot of people lose power. What do they need to do? Well, I, I live in Florida too, and that was one of my biggest concerns uh, when I when I bought the about ten years ago the, the home I'm in, and I decided to to take the most secure route. I put in a 20 kW uh, standing generator. It's a fixed generator. I hooked it up to natural gas, but I also hooked it up to a propane tank that is a backup to the natural gas and can supply me for a whole week. I was oh, wow. in the house with Irma. And uh, everybody in my neighborhood lost power. I just, you know, sailed through the week with the fridge, the air conditioning. Obviously, the pool was not running. Uh, but, you know, to me, that was the most secure solution. Now, you can buy these, you know, kind of mobile generators. Mm -hmm. But you really got to be careful with them because they can, you know, be unsafe. Right. If you don't know how to use them. If you don't know how to co connect the electrical. If you're not, uh, you know, making sure that the exhaust leaves the, the, the garage or wherever you have it and doesn't enter the house. And also handling the fuels can be, can be dangerous. Also supplying fuel, you know, getting the fuel, you know, can be right. difficult uh, in a disaster situation. If it's gasoline, you know, hauling it in and, and then, you know, filling the tank. So I vote, my vote is for the, uh, you know, permanent uh, generators. And, and that's the way I would go. If one has the means, they tell me it's a great idea. All right, that's Eric Papad Aris Papadopoulos with the Resilience Action Fund. Thank you, Eris. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and talk to Tom. Yeah, Tom, if I can just suggest, you know, people who, who want more information can go to my website, yeah. buildingresilient.com. Okay. And there's a nice resource there that I created with another nonprofit a couple years ago. It's called the Buyer's Guide to Resilient Homes. 
and it helps people not only who are looking to buy a home, but also are looking to renovate, uh, to prioritize things that will protect their household and obviously their pocketbooks too. All right. I appreciate both those websites you've turned us on to today. Thank you, Eris. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Tom. And thank you for watching Talk to Tom. You can watch anytime here on Thursday afternoons at 530 on the powerful WKMG at anytime, 24-7 on News 6+. Plus. Have a great week.